Just one more moment while we let a few more folks join in. Okay, thank you everyone for joining the Trusted Sec webinar today on cloud compliance. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. It will be sent out an email and also available on our website if you miss any part of it. My name is Stephen Marshwitz, the Director of Practice Development here at Trusted Sec, and wanted to just welcome you and give you a little background uh, for the webinar today. Cl compliance in the cloud has been a huge issue, uh, continues to grow we seem to uh, continue to get questions on it. And today's, uh, today's uh, webinar will go into more of the technical areas of some of the approaches and, and, and areas that we're seeing um, from a security standpoint. Uh, a little quick background on TrustedSec. Our mission is to change the security industry for the better. And one of those ways is that we try to do that is to provide free tools, tactics, information, and call and support. Um, so feel free, you know, if you have questions uh, pretty much at any time, but if you have questions even after this webinar uh, to, you know, give us a call and we're happy to walk through and take some time with you to go over the, the details of what, you know, what you're struggling with. Um, and, you know, we, we generally, again, as security is getting more and more complex, it's getting more and more uh, difficult. Um, the, so Trusted Sex starts out with really the most challenging aspect of security. And that's understanding the real world effectiveness of security controls by investing really in those cutting edge research. So over the last year and a half or so, we've uh, developed a tremendous research team uh, and we build those techniques and, and, uh, and that research into everything that we do. So it makes a tremendous difference in the value that you receive. Um, when, we, when we really leverage that to align to the risks that the business face, uh, we, we get a much broader picture and a much better understanding of the issues that you face, the, the tools that you might need, uh, processes and, and people that you have uh, to, to utilize to get, your pro, uh, to get your program running. So a little bit on the services. Uh, we are a full service security uh, uh, consulting company. Um, we'll go through a few. Incident response has been especially uh, hot lately, unfortunately. Uh, we have seen a lot in business email compromise, invoice fraud, that type of thing, especially lately, so something to be aware of. Um, we are have a you know strong offering in our purple team from both the defensive and offensive, which is again gaining steam. Risk assessments are making a comeback again as organizations realize that more and more they have to talk to the executives. And then lastly, we've uh, introduced a new service around remediation. And as I was saying, so many of the uh, projects and, and, and uh, technologies are so complicated. Now, even in just in, in uh, what we do in penetration testing, you used to be able to just be a penetration tester. Now everyone has to have a specialty in what they do. So with that, uh, the similarly in you know, issues that you will have, you know, sometimes it's just a week project that you need, or sometimes it's, you know, a couple of days, sometimes it's a couple of months, depending on what it is you're trying to roll out. So uh, we've, we heard from our customers that there was a lot of demand and desire for help in all of, when we find uh, issues. And so we've uh, begun to roll that out and, and already have seen uh, tremendous success with it. So with that, I wanted to introduce our speaker for today, Justin Leapline. Um, he is our PCI practice lead, uh, known Justin for many, many uh, years and really is always impressed by the technical background um, as it relates to compliance and just technical background in general. So with that, let me turn it over to you, Justin. 
Thanks so much. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Steve, and good afternoon, everyone. So a little bit about me and my experience, just to kind of start this off. So I've been in the security industry for quite a few years, probably going on dedicated-wise 15-plus years um, and been in kind of your roles as well as for, you know, uh, building up infrastructures, kind of uh, doing the whole, you know, cloud before it even was called uh, cloud uh, computing and everything like that. And specifically, uh, just before I started with TrustedSec, I actually was a part of the largest e-commerce uh, company, dedicated e-commerce company in the Pittsburgh area and uh, was head of security for that. Um, so have a lot of experience with a lot of different, um, you know, containerized solutions, different cloud uh, type solutions there. And we're going to be talking about a number of different things uh, all the way through this. Um, my talk mainly is more about the solutions. We're going to touch a little bit about you know some of the risk uh, with doing uh, containers and things of that nature and what to watch out for, but mainly geared. This is kind of the the solution aspects, and we're going to be talking about a number of things uh, going to that there. So first off, before we even begin, I want to say that this is a very very heavy product and vendor mentioned um, you know talk here. Keep in mind, as a trusted tech, we don't endorse, you know, uh, any one vendor. There's a lot of solutions out there that can uh, work for you. Um, and there's a lot of variations even with those solutions. So just keep in mind that as we're talking through this, if we mention a vendor or something like that, don't feel like, hey, we're endorsing them. This is purely the solutions that are out there. And I'm giving some high level examples or what some of the big players are in there or some of the more popular ones. But there may be other solutions out there. In fact, we're just scratching the surface with this presentation here. So as we start, let's start where, what are containers? Um, so first off, Docker, if you're not familiar, is one of the more popular containers, probably you know, the most popular container uh, platform out there. Um, the way it's different than, you know, to say uh, VMware or something like that is it runs based on the host operating system and spins up almost, um, you know, on a per application basis. So if you see here from, you know, this is straight from Docker's website, you know, Docker runs on the underlying host operating system and spins up different applications. Whereas if you do, you know, traditional hypervisor, that guest operating system is replicated on a per use basis. So um, from a hypervisor, it's easier to isolate, but it's easier to scale from a containerized type solution. So if you need, application A, B, and C to run, you can run these uh, uh, different variations of the application or maybe different service or workload type uh, perspectives all on the same operating system. This allows you to scale up uh, much more quickly because you're not scaling up a whole operating system just for one application or you know groups of servers or something like that. Um, but there are risks to that and we'll discuss that in a little bit uh, later. And another thing to keep in mind too, you know, as you know, we talk about uh, Docker Swarm, which is the first logo, uh, Kubernetes, DCOS, which is actually the old uh, Mesos uh, thing. It's the, the commercial uh, aspect and Red Hat has their own open shift. These are what's known as container orchestration. So as the prior example, you can launch up many different applications on one host. But how do you scale that out? When do you trigger to actually bring up a new host? When do you, you know, create a new, uh, new VM to launch up more hosts as your resources become depleted? All that, the logic is built into these container orchestrations. I would say probably the most popular out of them, obviously Kubernetes, you know, backed by Google and everything is some of the more popular one. Uh, AWS, Azure, you know, they all support uh, uh, variations of um, their own kind of implementation of Kubernetes. Uh, Docker Swarm basically came out from Docker um, and it's great from running simple applications. Uh, Kubernetes comes into that, it, it, it's more full featured. You can actually auto scale uh, much more easily. You can do it with Docker Swarm, but it's usually kind of band-aids onto it. Um, it doesn't do it out of the box. Um, and some of the Mesos stuff and Red Hat, I haven't, I, we ran Mesos in my prior company. Um, and the scalability, you can launch stuff by hand, uh, that auto scaling uh, comes in from the commercial side. So, you know, just keep that in mind uh, with that there. So first off, as we kind of dive into this, there's a lot of different considerations when just first talking about uh, containers. 
And it's a little bit different than when we talk about a standard OS uh, base hardening. So when we go to, you know, basic OS hardening, it's okay, what's a, you know, minimize the what's uh, installed on there, you know, make sure there's no vulnerabilities, any packages, uh, you know, do secure configurations on the system, the basic stuff that, you know, us in security have been dealing with uh, for a number of years. With containers, it's a little bit different, whereas each one of these different applications that are running, if you're not doing specific things, can break out of its, um, out of its, um, uh, its own little uh, pod, which means that if you're running, say, five applications on a container and you don't have the correct security uh, settings and isolation settings into there, a compromise on one could mean a compromise on all those and the underlying host operating system. So there are other considerations when we're looking at just from purely from a basic uh, OS level of hardening. So first thing um, that we have to be wary of is, of course, unpatched uh, packaging and systems. We're going to be looking at you know uh, some of that stuff there, but. Keep in mind, I wanted to just throw this in here because it is not unlike anything else. Just because you're running a containerized system does not mean you stop worrying about vulnerabilities. You still have an underlying OS operating system. You still have packages and dependencies that you're uh, pulling in that are you know, going to have vulnerabilities required uh, to update with that. And if you're not looking out for those, um, you know, they will uh, expose different vulnerabilities to your systems. Uh, container breakout. So it, we just mentioned this. If one application has like a uh, uh, privileged kind of uh, flag to it, um, it's running as the same uh, base permissions as the container itself, where a compromise to that could lead to, you know, uh, 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 to the compromise to those breakouts there. Uh, denial of service. Um, if you don't put limits on uh, the resources, um, it could, uh, a pod could actually uh, eat up all the resources dedicated to that container there. And untrusted images, we're going to talk a little bit about how to keep the integrity to the images you're pushing. And this is the whole Docker container base uh, with that there. So actually hardening the container here. So using a hardened image and or minimal image, there's a lot out there. Um, Alp Alpine, which is based on kind of a busy box implementation is great. A uh, number of people use Ubuntu or Core OS, uh, which does provide you know, a lot of good functionality. Um, sometimes though, um, maybe too much functionality, there's actually more work to actually limit those, um, those images there. Um, so just keep in mind, um, they, they also have, Google does the, um, uh, the uh, Harden OS, uh, it's called COS, um, which is kind of their own uh, implementation, but they also support Ubuntu. Just keep in mind as you're going through that, that there are different variations and depending on your application and what it needs from the host, it could uh, mean different variations into that. Um, Isolating the image from each other and the host itself. So there's a lot of different things um, that to implement this, and we're going to go into specific examples. Um, Read-only volumes on the actual core configuration. So you know any changes would need a reboot to that, which you know hopefully would be triggered from some of the alerting. Uh, tying limiting user permissions to actually um, the actual uh, pods themselves. Um, this can be used by like uh, name uh, spaces as an example, or you know tying uh, less restricted user access to that. And then you know using SecComp, which is a uh, uh, kind of a virtualization or it's a, a, a limiting box, and then App Armor is a, a mandatory access control, similar to SE Linux. If people are familiar with that, App Armor is a little bit easier. But all these things are great to actually implement to keep you know, those isolations between the different applications on the container itself. Um, and then obviously, as we mentioned before, implementing controls to avoid resource starvation is uh, really important. Um, a number of good recommendations. Uh, CIS, you know, we cite this a lot here at Trusted Site, but they have a number of great resource and documentation on uh, a lot of the stuff. Um, here's some just specific examples on some of the things with Docker, Google Cloud Platform, and Amazon Web Services that they've actually uh, come out uh, with. So we mentioned a little bit about isolation. Um, SecComp uh, is a great tool, and if anybody's familiar with the like the old 
if you remember like the anonymous FTP, if you're setting up on a Linux system and if you ever like FTP'd into that, you'd see like kind of a, a base OS into there, like a fake password file, fake shadow files, you know, kind of a, a rough thing, but they weren't actually the same files that were used for the OS. This is similar to what SecComp does is basically for each one of the applications, it creates a shell of the OS. It's not fully running the OS, but it's kind of a shell from some of the base uh, configurations and everything. Um, we mentioned using Docker user namespaces, basically keeping those uh, user components into certain applications and you can limit actually communication based on those namespaces there. Uh, mandatory access control app armor is what I typically recommend. SE Linux is obviously is notorious for being a little bit complicated for setting up. Uh, app armor tries to simplify that and there's some great profiles out on GitHub with that. And then one thing too that we're talking about isolation. So with Docker files and everything, there's actually an expose where you can expose some of the ports and protocols to each one of the applications. But keep in mind, that's not full-fledged actual segmentation from a host level perspective. Um, always recommend that uh, within, you know, your uh, Docker setup with host file, you set up IP tables as well, you know, with that there. Uh, so here's a great example. One of the things I want to uh, show AWS actually has under their security hub. Um, great things that actually tie back to CIS, the AWS foundations. This is right out of the box and everything. It shows, you know, all the stuff tied to each one of the CIS requirements and it actually goes into what accounts are set up and everything like that. So you can actually measure on the, um, on the things you're deploying within your environment, what's actually uh, applied, you know, to the standard, what's not, everything like that. And another thing that's great is Docker actually produces a great uh, benchmark tool um, for ensuring security partitions for the containers that's been created. Um, and this is right off of GitHub. I have the link down below and everything. It's an awesome uh, type thing. All you do is uh, you run it within your uh, uh, container and it'll look at all of the different uh, pods that you have out there, all the different applications and it'll go through each one of those. I definitely don't recommend this run in production. This is more of a doing it within a staging or while you're building your minimum security baselines to ensure you're hitting all this stuff. Uh, typically within production, you want to minimize as much as you can to, um, to what's ne necessary within the environment. Uh, another great tool that you can actually use inline with your Docker file is uh, Hadolint. Um, it basically looks at your specific Docker file instance and making sure that it's best practice with that. Um, so it'll call out different things. This, they have this all documented within their GitHub uh, thing that they'll look at the different perspectives and say, hey, this is an issue. You shouldn't be using copy, you know, um, type of thing um, and give you different pointed recommendations. The nice thing about this as well is uh, we're gonna talk about it a little bit later within your pipeline but you can actually put in different configurations right in line within your Docker file. So say for example, you don't care that from Ubuntu, it's not labeled with a specific version or anything like that, which will just pull the latest. Maybe you just don't care. Maybe this is a test environment and you're just not that concerned with it breaking. You can put in ignore files straight into your configuration to be able to tailor it to your specific um, uh, baseline standard with it. Um, one, another popular tool, it's similar to the Docker security uh, baseline is inspect. Um, so this is a great that you run it, it uh, runs, um, it's a Ruby uh, type command. Again, um, you know, look at this, it goes through looking at the, all the different uh, configurations. Here's an example that looks at password max days, password min days. And if it's not as expected to your baselines, then it will actually flag and uh, be reported within the logs uh, with that there. So perfect tool. Again, run it outside of production. This should be a uh, more of a uh, going through your pipeline type of thing. And quickly on serverless. Um, so I wanted to touch on this real quickly because there are a lot of things out there that you know everybody talks about the serverless applications with it. So Google App Engine, Azure uh, Functions, and Lambda for AWS, they all have something that uh, you know is a serverless type application. Basically, I, I run this in a couple of projects that I maintain. 
Um, essentially, you're uploading your code and you do a configuration file for Google, it's uh, app.yaml, uh, where you basically specify out the routing, scaling, some security uh, uh, requirements. So I can specify, hey, for this route, it's going to trustedtech.com. That should always go over an HTTPS uh, connection. But everything behind the scenes, including the isolation and everything, is off to the cloud provider. And it's a great uh, situation where, you know, if you just have some uh, functions, you can even run a you know, full-blown web stack with it. Um, or a lot of people use it as, you know, kind of a mobile backend where you have a lot of mobile, um, you know, endpoints hitting or IoT. A lot of people do this for IoT type events and functions into it. Uh, the bad thing about this is obviously you're kind of tied to the cloud providers environment. So if you're doing a lot of coding with this, any persistent data or anything like that has to be tied to somewhere else. You can't store on the host that you're doing this. So if you're doing, you know, a typical flat file system, S3 bucket or Google storage buckets, you know, with that, if you're doing some type of, you know, like, um, you know, uh, uh, it, uh, non-persistent type data like Redis or Memcache or something like that, you're going to have to point those uh, to other services in it. And oftentimes that comes with tying to whatever cloud provider you're using. So if you're doing uh, a good example is a cloud bucket, you'll have to make calls to the certain paths to GS colon slash slash, which is pointing to a cloud bucket with that. So all of a sudden, if you uh, decide you don't want to use Google anymore and say, you know, I want to use AWS, you have coding updates to do. So it kind of limits you to that. Also too, uh, as we mentioned, um, that it limits the access to the system. So there might be some system calls or things of that nature that you just won't be able to do. They restrict those to, you know, only to what's in the application environment. So, you know, things that run great, you know, within these uh, uh, environments of like a Go uh, type application or Python, things that might be a little bit more challenging would be like a .NET or a PHP uh, type thing. They, 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 certain people do it. So for example, AWS, I don't believe has a PHP solution yet. Google does um, have one. Um, but they both run Go, they both run Python, uh, things of that nature. So it really comes down to what your application needs, how it's designed, and making those choices, you know, based on that. One of the things I love about serverless is that um, it doesn't charge you if it's not being run. So if you're running a container application, it's constantly eating up, you know, some type of, uh, of pricing uh, based on just it running and existing. With this service type stuff, uh, typically what the pricing is that you only get priced on per uh, call. So if nobody's actually calling your application, you're not eating up, you know, some of those costs there. So going into monitoring here. So there are plenty of tools to choose from. Some are better, some are, you know, worse and require more manual effort. But we're going to talk a few of these here. So Audit D is a great one and pretty much, unless you're running a very minimalized um, uh, uh, container uh, operating system, all of them have it, Ubuntu, CoreOS, et cetera. So definitely recommend it. It puts a lot of different logs in there. You can actually achieve um, some of the aspects of logging the um, everything that a you know administrator does, which is a PCI requirement, that can all be done through Audit D. Um, and it will create a number of different other rules that it's uh, based on a profile that you create at the beginning and it dumps out a whole bunch of log uh, uh, information that you can then ingest and look for specific incidents with this. Um, OS Query is a great tool for uh, looking at some of the aspects of what's in your environment, what's open, it's actually great from a, an incident response uh, tool as well. Uh, once you get it kind of configured, basically what it does, it's uh, an agent that runs on the host operating system itself, but has Docker modules that can uh, understand and digest, you know, what apps and what, uh, what you're scaling into that. And it will look at it from a query perspective. So it's exactly like SQL query. So you're calling different tables and getting different data elements out of it. And you can quit, quickly query your entire environment and get back very pointed information, including misconfigurations and things of that nature. And we actually have a, a few examples that I'm gonna show you here in the next couple of slides. 
Uh, we already mentioned Inspect uh, with some of that stuff there. Uh, OpenSCAP um, is really based on NIST, but it does have some template profiles for PCI and other stuff uh, with that. That will give you uh, great information on the baseline uh, with this. And then Claire is core OS only, but it is also a great open source tool that you can also use. Um, on that, you know, from a host IPS perspective, um, OSSEC, I uh, typically recommend. It has some great profiles and there's some great resources out on GitHub that if you just do a quick Google search, you can see a whole bunch of uh, things on that. Uh, Falco is actually a pretty cool little tool that it actually, um, it brings out some of the Docker specific instances on looking at some of the behavioral type stuff. So, uh, and then obviously there's a whole bunch of commercial tools out there that uh, can help you uh, manage your environment. So, you know, including, you know, Carbon Black and other stuff out there. So here's a good example of, you know, OS Query. Um, I'm running uh, basically right on my, you know, host here, but uh, deployed into, you know, environment, you can actually look at all the different uh, perspectives on what's listening on your system. And this is great from a kind of a profiling perspective on, you know, what should be listening and what is listening on this. Uh, typically when we go into assessments of customers, um, you know, this is a manual poll uh, where you're doing, uh, you know, some type of net stack command if you have OS query kind of listed out, you can pull all this and get it all back, you know, within 20 seconds of your entire environment. Um, so nice little thing. And then here's an example of a misconfiguration. So I mentioned real quickly that um, having kind of the un, uh, uh, unprivileged uh, flag onto your system gives you full rights to whatever the, um, the container uh, is running at. So you're basically running as root on the host uh, machine there. Um, so this is a, um, you know, a configuration through CIS is the big no-no uh, with that. If there is any compromises, obviously that leads to full system compromise. So this is a quick one that you can actually see uh, run a, a quick, you know, uh, select query and you get exactly back what's running as unprivileged and what, you know, that's uh, obviously an impact too and remediate them. Uh, another thing we should uh, real quickly, the compliance standards for AWS, but this is, um, the overall summary to that, also a number of things that it looks at from a misconfiguration uh, perspective, looking at, you know, guard duty inspector uh, Macy uh, from some of those findings and everything um, that will come up into this overall portal. This gives you a good monitoring aspect for your entire uh, uh, situation uh, within uh, AWS for what's hosted there. And then one of the cool things is you can actually create your own insights into it. So you can add, uh, put different rules into it, look at different stuff, pulling back and actually create, you know, some specific rules into there. And then from a findings perspective, you know, everything that's coming out, you know, through this, you can actually see from a severity level and depending on what your, you know, uh, vulnerability management policy says, you can actually deal with um, all the different stuff within there and you can monitor your entire environment. And this is all out of the box with AWS, which is a really nice feature with that um, for what AWS does. Google actually has some as well. Um, and I think, yep, yep, we have an example of that. Um, I didn't have any findings in this, but it's similar to their, uh, um, to their uh, uh, AWS's security uh, center where, you know, they'll uh, look at a number of different things and outlist the findings, the assets, everything along that lines. Um, this is a great thing to get your security operations center involved in, have, you know, read only access to your compliance people so they can, you know, uh, spot check and make sure everything's getting set up accordingly or pull evidence for, for different, um, the different assessments that they need to do. Um, you'll notice also too, that I just want to bring up real quick on the left-hand side, um, it's in beta right now, but binary authorization, we're going to touch on a little bit later. Uh, essentially, you can build in rules that while you're uh, promoting different images into your containers, um, you can actually put uh, checks into there that it has to pass or it will not actually go into it. And they do have a break class type of thing, but it's kind of a nice feature to say, hey, if there's any unpatched vulnerabilities, it does not go into production. And this is, you know, a configuration you can implement with that. And one of the things I did want to pull up, uh, TwistLock is a popular container um, 
uh, third party commercial product. Um, I have a few customers that have used it. They've been extremely happy with them. Um, and they do a lot of good things like right out of the box that you can do like setting up rules on different environments, you know, and putting in the different resources that actually apply to that. Um, as you can see, they have stuff for GDPR, PCI, you know, 800-190, which is the Docker uh, recommendation, HIPAA. And you can actually put in, you know, right into this, um, you know, what's, you know, a, a blocker, what should be alerted on, what things you don't care about. So definitely a good, you know, a tool that if it's within your budget, uh, definitely check out, you know, type of thing. And vulnerability and patching, you know, we mentioned this real quick on uh, some of the stuff, but catching issues prior to deployment and, um, and existing in the production is basically the two main areas you need to kind of focus on. And if you're going more to the CI CD, you should be catching 99.99% prior to deployment with that. Uh, production is more from the, you know, the, if we miss anything, we still need to do checks in the production. But a lot of that stuff should be weeded out through uh, the use of tools and before promoting into production there. So obviously a number of commercial tools from uh, vulnerability patching. I list them here because I know these ones actually have specific Docker uh, checks uh, within here. So Rapid7, Qualys, uh, Nessus, they all have specific things that they check for in a containerized environment um, with this. Obviously these are credentialed scans, so you would need to basically either have an agent, which is the preferred thing. Um, it's simply recommend not to run an SSH agent on uh, some of the containers. Um, but if it, you can't do an agent and you, you know, you want to look at an SSH and, you know, uh, handle the SSH keys and all that stuff, it can be done also through that as well. Um, the biggest issue after you go through the hardening um, exercise, getting it down to images that you're pushing out uh, appropriately is actually package management and code vulnerabilities is really the, the core focus on a lot of that stuff. So package management that you will have vulnerabilities that come through that you will have to update um, type of thing. Um, and if you don't uh, update those, um, you know, they, they will come out to that. One of the things that I will point out a little bit later is the use of latest as a tag. You know, a lot of people say, okay, I'm gonna use the latest package. So I'll always get the latest updated and you know, vulnerabilities uh, within there, which you know, is commendable, but also too, you need to consideration the ramifications of doing production issues. Um, with the latest tag on different packages, you can't guarantee that the one you just tested within stage is the same one that's gonna get deployed within production. So typically I recommend that you lock into a major uh, version flag and maybe um, you know, depending on how many subversions it, it is, um, definitely from a major that it won't uh, update the major. And then from a minor perspective, you might want to lock in those, but that puts more onus on you to actually ensure that those versions are up to date uh, type of thing. And I just wanted to, the screenshot below, um, Google actually puts in something that it scans your Docker images every time you upload the, um, the Docker manifest. Um, that it will actually um, it'll point out actual vulnerabilities that it sees straight out of that. So that's a nice feature that then uh, what I mentioned before, you can actually tie, it, tie into the binary authorization and actually you know, decide whether to promote it or not. So an up, a couple of other considerations. So we mentioned monitoring and hardening with this. Uh, obviously, there's more than, you know, just that. So one of the biggest ones uh, that I just want to call out is secrets management. You should not be embedding any type of, um, you know, keys within your Docker file, within obviously the code, anything along that line. So it should be environment specific and it should be ideally stored in some type of centralized uh, spot on a per environment basis, you know, type of thing. So there are a number of things that, you know, cloud providers actually provide you and they're fairly reasonably priced and everything. So, you know, between key management as a software uh, based uh, uh, key management system, HSM, obviously a hardware uh, component, same thing with Google with the cryptographic keys versus the cloud HSM. So depending on your need for that, a lot of people can, you know, get away with just doing software based, but if you're doing, you know, FIPS or something along that lines that you'll need that added, 
you know, that added uh, protection there, then, you know, you can pay a little bit more money for that. You can also use your own vaults uh, with this. So I've used in the past a uh, vault from HashiCorp. Um, great implementation. You could throw it up uh, with yourself. Um, the key management is done with an elliptical curve uh, base um, uh, key management. So you can give case out to five people and only three are required to actually, you know, uh, unencrypt the volume. That is what's needed with that. Um, I haven't used much with uh, KeyWiz, but that is another solution with that. Again, you know, with these solutions there, you just need to make sure that it needs to be maintained. Um, a number of compliance requirements also require some type of rotation, depending on the key usage and everything like that. Um, you know, just keep in mind that you will have to rotate the key somehow. Um, for most uh, different standards and compliance things. Um, a lot of the cloud providers provide you automatic ways to actually rotate the key. The thing that you need to build within your application on using those is how do you deal with a payload that's being encrypted with an old key and then rotate it to the new key. That's logic that needs to be built within your code there. And then, of course, logging, you know, just because it's running in an environment does not, you know, escape, you know, the actual logging requirements of this. So, like I mentioned before, cloud uh, providers have a lot of different, um, you know, uh, solutions already in there. So, CloudWatch, Stackdriver for Google, you know, Splunk has a cloud uh, platform that you can forward these logs to. Um, it just has a, a sys syslog digest or API calls that you can actually make. Um, I've used Sumo Logic in the past. It's a very... Splunk-like interface uh, to that. Um, and typically I found it be a little bit more reasonably priced, but another solution to look at from a cloud perspective and everything. Or, you know, if you're going on, you know, a little bit cheaper, want to roll your own, um, obviously Elasticsearch, Logstash, um, or I have a buddy that actually contributes to the Metron project for Apache, uh, doing more with like threats and alerting uh, along that line. So definitely, you know, all good solutions to look into when considering what you need to afford these logs. At the end of the day, it's always recommended and required in some instances that you need to kind of centralize your logs so you can look at the different, um, the different issues and correlate them into what's going on within your environment. Um, here's an example of just real quick on, you know, the stack driver. They recently actually redid their interface, but you can create, you know, it's, it doesn't come out of the box looking at from a security perspective, but you could get it there with work. So you can create a learning policy, uh, a learning policies on different events that happen, different culmination events happen, um, having stack driver agents on the systems to actually, um, collect those customized dashboards, everything like that. And one thing I did want to just call out here, uh, continuous integration and continuous development. So as we're moving toward kind of this uh, cloud perspective, this is a great, you know, kind of segue into this. I'm not going to dive so deep into it. In fact, this whole presentation could probably be a week long, you know, in different environments. But one to mention, you know, kind of the things to consider when uh, putting through, uh, through this uh, type of thing. So. Keep in mind, both code and infrastructure, where we're talking about containers here, need to be checked and secured prior to the release. We mentioned a lot of the different checks as going through this. Um, those checks it should uh, be going through in your continuous integration as fails along those pipelines. So if you're going through and you're detecting vulnerabilities based on your Docker file and it's calling out, hey, there's an outdated version, it has a vulnerability associated to it, there should be a hard fail on promoting into the next um, into the next environment until there's some remediation going into that. So that's what we're mentioning about some of the dependencies uh, with that there. Um, and keep in mind configurations implemented uh, per the hardening baselines. We mentioned checking this prior to production because we don't want that overhead into production, but still need to be checked, you know, uh, before going into that. And then. Obviously the code, the code never escapes kind of your responsibility. Uh, no cloud provider is gonna say, you know, what you're doing is uh, from a coding perspective is a-okay from us and, you know, certified to that. So there's always a aspect to making sure that, you know, um, the what you're coding is um, good from that perspective. Um, AWS has their uh, inspector that does assessments. I like a little bit, uh, Google has, uh, um, 
um, scanning directly to web applications and Docker. So they do a little bit better from that perspective. AWS, I think, does a better perspective from overarching kind of your baseline and showing you some of the stats with that. So there's plus and minus wherever you go for that uh, type of thing. But just keep in mind, you know, as a thing, like Veracode, a lot of our customers like those kind of integration into like Jenkins as their kind of CI, CD. Um, but there are a number of other open source ones as well out there. Or you can run, you know, trigger off scans, um, you know, from your vulnerability scanner as well. And then from a pipelines perspective, um, you know, it's, it, it, I, I've gotten this question a kind of a, a, a couple of times is, you know, do we incorporate the Docker kind of uh, container configuration within our application? Should it be separate, you know, type of thing uh, versus our code? Um, and my typical recommendation, obviously there's a lot of variables that kind of play into that, but my typical recommendation is it should, um, for the most part, be into two separate repositories. And the code should be referencing the trusted image repository for uh, what you're building. Um, the situation you want to kind of avoid when uh, doing the pipelines is, um, say, you know, you have a, you know, an image update that you need to do, you know, say, an added dependency. You needed some type of Node.js package or, you know, some type of uh, Go library added but also you're updating code at the same time. You don't wanna kind of cycle through your Docker images to upload that and fix it and then upload the code. And then it would cycle through and rotate the Docker images as well. So it'd almost be like a double kind of uh, uh, reboot, you know, on uh, some of those things. And you can roll uh, updates to it, but typically what you wanna do is, um, put in the changes to your containers, tag it with whatever that specific version is, and then upload it to a trusted image repository. Um, sign, you know, by the company, put out through you know, your, uh, um, uh, your CI CD into that trusted repository. Then as the code pushed out, you would have a Docker file that would tie your specific company image to that version that it needs to update. So if you're adding new functionality that requires, you know, kind of that Docker image, it would only recycle once, you know, with that. So you're saying, I need this image from this repository. And Google has, you know, their own container registration, Docker Hub, you know, is a popular one out there, AWS, all the popular ones have that. But just keep in mind that, you know, you want to kind of push it to there and then update your code and it will pull from that image um, from there. And then we mentioned a little bit about the latest tag. Um, you know, it puts, if you don't use the latest tags, it's more onus on making sure those Docker images are up to date. Um, but if you do the latest, um, there could be risk to actually doing uh, production issues where you're pulling in added functionality that isn't necessarily tested and could break your applications with it. So, and always too, if you're worried about the actual integration, you can always, uh, before you actually turn on the actual CI uh, flag or the, or the CD flag, you can always do pre-checks of this. So in, in a Docker environment. So, you know, and I'm a big fan of the Atlassian uh, products. You know, they have a nice clean interface. There are a ton out there. You know, GitHub has their own stuff as well that you could use, but you can actually, you know, push this through from a pipeline perspective and make sure if you're comfortable with all the checks that you're doing, that it would check everything. You can push it through automatically. If you still require a manual approval and making sure everything's good, you can do something like this and actually just push it out by hand. But the process looks exactly the same. It's just whether there's a stop gate to it. And with that, we're to the questions part. All right, thanks, Justin. That was uh, packed of information. Um, unbelievable how much uh, you went through there. And we have quite a few questions actually. So um, the first uh, set of them are around segmentation. Yep. Um, and uh, first one is, uh, how can a company leverage containerization to implement multi-tenant data segmentation? Uh, and then I'll, and then, and then another one is how does network segmentation impact container security? Yep. So uh, I'll address the, um, the multi-segment first or uh, with uh, multiple customers in the same application there. So when you're developing for a multi-tenant, uh, really the onus comes down to you on how you're going to separate those customer environments. So it really puts the, the access control within the application itself. 
um, containers, not containers. Um, there's really no difference. Now you can, I have a few customers that, um, you know, on a per application level, they'll replicate uh, the container on a per customer. Obviously that's a lot of overhead, but depending on your, you know, risk tolerance on, you know, bleeding, you know, uh, different customer information um, and whether you can do that through code or not, is really up to you at the end of the day. Um, typically uh, to reduce the overhead and for scalability and flexibility, um, most customers try to accomplish that within the application itself and doing the access. And then um, the next question, Steve, can you repeat yep. that? Yeah, how does network segmentation impact container security? Does it have to be software defined segmentation and any challenges to uh, network segmentation? Yep, absolutely. So yeah, we mentioned um, uh, before, it does uh, um, have to be software defined. Obviously, these are containers and with VMs running uh, on that and all the kind of network scopes um, are defined through which networks you're assigning each of the uh, the containers and specifically even the individual pods, you know, for that. Um, now you can add on layers, you know, we mentioned a little bit about IP tables and actually putting that on host to reinforce what you're expecting. But um, typically the networks are tied to each one of the applications and then you can actually, you know, layer on that, you know, which ones can talk uh, to each one of them. Um, one of the things I didn't mention because this is a huge topic and we could spend, you know, like I said, days just talking about this is um, the act of, you know, between your applications actually doing an encrypted uh, communications with that. So there are communications between each one of the applications and depending if you have a, you know, multi-node uh, type environment. So not just all located on one VM, there could be, a hundred VMs with, you know, a thousand different applications running on that, that communication is always good to be encrypted between those uh, type of, uh, uh, um, between, you know, each one of the uh, containers with that. Um, obviously, we're just boiling it down to, you know, good network security uh, recommendations. And if one host is compromised, what can they do by looking at some of the traffic and potentially injecting some of that, uh, you know, malicious traffic there. Great. A uh, couple of questions on um, hacking. First one is, what might be a sample technique a malicious individual would use to break out of the container? Yeah, so, um, you know, if the systems aren't hardened and we went through all those different things, um, probably the most popular one is container breakout. So if you can get down to um, a host operating system level, uh, you basically own the entire box. So uh, we mentioned about the unprivileged flag, Docker can run with various forms of uh, privileges and even the actual applications themselves that are being pushed out. If you get to one that hasn't been properly secured, if there's a, you know, uh, insecure web application that, you know, allows some type of command line execution, you could, you know, um, you know, hop over to other different Docker instances and even, you know, compromise potentially the orchest uh, orchestration itself which at that point you can inject, you know, malicious images or things of that nature um, with it. So there's, there's a ton of uh, recommendations and everything like that. OWASP um, has started to uh, produce stuff out on GitHub on some of the things and actual uh, core examples, but there's a ton of content out there on that. And I think there's even a few labs that you can do to play around with some, you know, uh, hackable uh, Docker containers. And you pretty much answered this, but uh, what are the most likely or prevalent attacks? Yeah, I mean, we covered a little bit about that. Obviously, you know, um, compromising and breaking out of the, uh, the containers and applications themselves. Um, you know, patching never goes away. You keep it up to date to that. Uh, resource uh, starvation, which is, you know, basically if one application can get hit really hard, would it bring down the other applications that are running on the same host? Uh, so putting limitations in around those applications on eating up memory or CPU utilization. Um, and then, um, yeah, and that's uh, pretty much it for the majority of them. Okay, great. Could you uh, explain again, what does hardening the container versus hardening the OS mean? Yeah, so the actual OS, um, and if you refer back to that image that I had with uh, Docker there, the 
the Docker container runs on top of the OS. So when we're talking about, you know, the container run on top, you're still running on a full-fledged OS system. Um, so whether that be Ubuntu, Core OS, whatever that may be. So you still need to look at that image and harden that so that there's not, you know, um, undo exposures out there to, you know, some of the system configurations. When we're talking about hardening the container itself, it's, you know, what permissions are running on, you know, the container, how is it mounting up some of the applications? Uh, so for example, is it the core configurations? Is it mounted up under read only? And, you know, uh, persistent data is, uh, you know, mounted up on a, uh, another volume outside of that. So you'll see like logs typically with that, or if the application needs a, a persistent data, like an S3 bucket or something, um, and different things like that. So it's just a different layer uh, from those different hardening perspectives. And if you look on, you know, those CIS guidelines, the CIS one for Docker is specific to Docker. And then some of the other aspects like the AWS stack is the full stack under AWS. And you can also look at, you know, your specific uh, Linux platform that you're running. Most popular um, out there is either like an Alpine or an Ubuntu, or, you know, if you're running under Google, the, uh, you know, the container OS, um, you know, type of platform. Excellent. How does file integrity monitoring FIM requirements for monitoring critical files apply to containers? Yep. So each Great. app oriented versus OS oriented. Yeah, so great question. Um, so you can do a couple of things to actually avoid doing FIM on the specific Docker applications. Like I mentioned before, if you're doing a read only on some of the core critical file system, they should never change within the production. And we've accepted stuff under like, you know, uh, on like some of the uh, different um, uh, assessments that we do that if they're running under a read only, we take evidence of that. And then, you know, we kind of put that to bed there, you know, that there should be no changes to the core configurations under that, um, you know, once it's mounted up and everything. So a great control with that, but you still have to worry about the host OS. So we mentioned like OS uh, query that actually runs as a FIM. There are a number of other applications that run from a FIM perspective. So you will need something underneath there. We mentioned OSSEC. It does generate uh, logs from a file integrity monitoring. Um, so you'll still need that type of perspective on the host, uh, you know, OS with that. Um, but there are a lot of tools out there and a lot of the things that I mentioned actually has that built into it. Okay, great. Are any regulations addressing container security and which, uh, which regulations are most impacted or have the strictest uh, controls in place currently? Yeah, I mean, there are um, typically the regulations and contractual compliances out there d don't address specifically containers. They address more uh, broad, you know, base of you need to have a secure OS, you need to have, you know, patches updated, things of that nature. Um, I'm not aware of any that call out directly containers, but I know there's some like uh, federal regulations of, you know, hosting stuff in the cloud. And there was one down in Australia um, that just came out to, you know, hosting some stuff in the cloud. Um, but, you know, those are the ones uh, with that perspective. Really, it comes down to just the basics, but it's Moreover, how do you apply those basics into this new environment? So patch management, segmentation, isolation, uh, good configuration management, proper you know, due diligence on your applications and scanning. So just fitting it into those buckets, it's really where the challenge comes down to. Excellent. And uh, I believe finally, would logging be the same? Can it be monitored, managed the same, or by an MSSP? How does that work? Yep. Yeah, so if logging is pretty much the same. You're still running an application within, you know, uh, an environment. Um, you know, typically what we see from customers is that they'll do the actual host OS logging from the, the host itself. 
Um, and then application specific logging, logging they'll actually forward to, you know, wherever they do their uh, application logging. So if somebody, you have the authentication portal, they'll actually forward that through either an API or something like that to whatever their log consolidator is um, with that, whether it be, you know, Datadog is out there or your SIM or Splunk or something of that nature. So it still needs to be monitored, you know, the same. So who's authenticating when it's uh, happening any changes. We mentioned Audit D as a thing to show, like, if there are any administrators, you know, logging onto the system, what are they doing? You know, type of thing. And you'll be able to, you know, track every single command that they're doing. Typically, though, for the most part, unless you're in a, you know, a critical, like, everything's down and we need to debug this, Docker images are meant to be expendable. And if there are problems, you know, you know, all the, you know, popular cloud providers and even um, Docker Swarm and Kubernetes, they'll watch out for like failed Docker process and, you know, kill it and respawn a new one, you know, if there are any issues uh, within there. So um, typically you won't see like users logging into a Docker container. And if there are, I would question why um, and just look at the process with that. And actually, one last one: is there an is there an assessment to ensure you're following good security practices around containers? Yeah, so I definitely recommend you know from a hardening standpoint and process base, um, you look at a lot of the content that we went over. Um, we can definitely uh, do them. In fact, we've done a number of them, you know, with uh, different uh, variations of our clients. Uh, usually within the PCI realm is where we do most of it. Um, but we have done uh, some other stuff where we guide, kind of guide it. And it's more than just, like I said, the hardening. Like if it was just hardening, you can take the CIS baseline and do your own analysis. And there's a bunch of tools out there for that. But it's also about the process, you know. So do you have who's responsible for ensuring patch management is into this? Is there a, you know, a continuous integration check within your promotion base that, you know, checks for different validation errors, as in, you know, outdated patches, as in non-signed uh, images, as in, you know, um, you know, misconfigurations that slipped in outside of our baseline, that type of thing. So it's usually a look at holistically, how are we doing this and what's our strategy for the cloud building security into that. Excellent. Well, Justin, thank you very much again for sharing so much knowledge with us today. Uh, really appreciate your time and, uh, and effort that you put into it. Obviously, uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, we'll uh, make sure that uh, any follow-ups, we'll make sure we get them over to you. And I just want to thank everyone, uh, all the participants for joining today and uh, keep an eye out for, the, for additional webinars. We have a few more coming up uh, in the next uh, couple of months. So, uh, always interesting and, and uh, a lot going on in security as it gets more and more complex. So thanks again for joining and we look forward to seeing you next time.